Good morning, fellow gardeners. Good morning, those who are just curious. We are back in the studio. I'm Brian Maine. Happy weekend to you. Hope you had a good week. Along with my colleagues, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. We are back and raring to go. Thank you for tuning in bright and early. Or maybe you're watching this show as a rerun. There are so many ways to watch us these days. No excuse. Be it Facebook, be it our YouTube channel, digital, streaming. You can't get away from us. So thank you for tuning in and supporting Garden America. Tiger Palafox has us up and running on uh, Facebook Live. We've uh, shared our show on uh, various platforms, and we're glad that you tuned in. John is tan, rested, and ready, looking good. Check out that camera. Check out John Begnasco. <laughs> morning. Good morning, everybody. Hey, you know, we... I'm always amazed that Tiger can walk in off the street. Two minutes later, we're up running, doing a show on Facebook Live. What about me? I had no cue card this morning. That was all just ad lib, that intro. Really? Yeah, of course. I should have paid more attention. I poo-poo cue cards. <laughs> Anyway, whatever's on your mind today, gardening-wise, aside from our topic, we're glad to help answer those questions. And, of course, we've got a guest lined up today, John's Quote of the Week. It's just going to be a, a jam-packed, fantastic show. What have you been doing out on your patio? Watering, 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 and more watering. It's been, uh, I, I, I think you're cooler than I am, aren't you? Well, I mean, you know, hey, come that on, goes huh? without saying. Hey, like, what are you talking about? Hey, huh? <laughs> goes without saying. Yeah, you're you're probably anywhere from five to eight degrees warmer really? on any given day. Because we've been we've been, uh, I would say, a low of eighty four up to eighty eight every single day. Yeah, we've been. Well, I'd say low eighties, yeah. maybe you know mid eighties at the, at the peak. Right. But um, yeah, you got to keep watering. As a matter of fact, the plant that I, one of the plants, well, Tiger brought in a spider plant, but I brought in Odontonema. And it was a <clears> plant <throat> that I was going to give Tiger for Christmas. But with the heat, I've had to water it every day, so I just brought it in to give to him now. Well, you know, you know why that works out? <laughs> Christmas in July. There you go. See, so there you go, and that's the and plant right there. just in time, too. Um, I, I didn't know if you ever had one of those, Tiger. Which one is it again? Odontonema. It's called purple, uh, purple, purple fire, fire what? I don't think, no, I, I haven't. Spike, fire spike, purple fire spike. Yeah, no, I haven't had one of those before. I feel like I've seen it before, but no, I've never had one. They like water. It's in the yeah. acanthus, uh, okay. acanthus family. So plenty of water, right? Yeah, I don't know about plenty, but it, if you don't water it, it wilts. So I've been watering it every day. If you don't and, water it, well, it's one of those plants. Yeah, right. Hey, I'm going to show you that I'm thirsty. Right. Water Fortunately, me. it's been coming back every time, but um, I figured I'll just give it to Tiger now. Let him take care of yeah, it. Yeah, Christmas in July. Merry Christmas, It does Tiger. have the tag inside. It's on a stake, Tiger, in case you forget the name. Does, your camera doesn't want to stay uh, balanced, does it? <laughs> You want me to do it for you? I got it. Because you don't want to be crooked. I see that we have a couple listeners from uh, Idaho, and I've been watching the channel. who would they be, John? Well, so far it's Rick and Gina, but I've been watching the temperatures in Idaho, and they've been in the hundreds. Yeah, we talked about that, how this time of the year, yeah. but in, in a lot of plants, or some plants that we don't think could take the heat, somehow do well in Idaho under those conditions. Yeah, and I, it doesn't make any sense to me. The other thing that doesn't make sense is as we get later in the evening, temperatures cool down right away here. And in Boise, they keep getting hotter up to like 6 o'clock or something. Yeah, but I would imagine at 10 p.m. in Idaho, it's still light. Is that true? Well, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Further yeah. north you go. Right. There's all northern lights, right? Yeah, I had a friend, uh, we had some friends we haven't seen in a while that uh, were visiting from Virginia. And they had come, they had come, the last time I think I saw them was at Christmas about 10 years ago. Maybe not quite that long ago. And at Christmas, of course, it's cold in Virginia, so they can't do, uh, they don't have much going on. But she liked the daylilies that I had, so... At Christmas, she dug up some. We dug up some of the daylilies, split them. She took them back to Virginia, and they all grew. They went to work in uh, Cuba for three years, two years, or three years, and they kept the 
the daylilies growing all that time. And the, she showed me pictures, and they were fantastic. They'd really spread. So they when they were over uh day before yesterday, we went through all my daylilies, split them again, and gave her a whole su- suitcase full to take wow. back to Virginia. Wow. So I figured if they did really well in December, if she plants them now, they ought to do really well. You know, those watching us on Facebook Live, we get the shot of Tiger, and he's very intent. He's very serious. As uh, it's up to him to keep us on the air live with our video cameras and our audio and all that. So that's what you see there with that. I thought he was frozen up, get, there, and then the, all of a sudden he stuck his head. No, up. he was very, in, uh, very intense there, uh, making sure that we're up. we're good, right? Up and oh right. yeah, we're we're good. I'm just trying to make little yeah. modifications right. that I can only do when we do go live. You know, that's right, the right. That, that is the hard part is that there are certain things that you can only do when you go when live. When we're actually live. Yeah, now, we've had to kind of. For the second week in a row, kind of backdoor our way to get on the air on yeah. Facebook because of some technical problems. So uh, you don't need to know about that, but we're on the air thanks to Tiger. Yeah, share away, please. Yeah, share. Ab- abs- when you're on Facebook watching us, share with your friends. Please. Well, Rick says please it's do. 106 in Idaho? Idaho today. Wow. So I'm wondering if uh, Kim in Tucson can beat that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Kim, but, are you on but, with us? But She's Rick's, on. But, but Rick's um, got a, a humid 106, right? Is it humid in in, in, uh, in Idaho? Idaho John? Yeah, no, Idaho's dry. No, is it dry, dry? here? Yeah. Oh, okay, because I was going to say Kim's got a dry yeah. out there in Tucson usually, although it is monsoon now, right? This time of year. Well, they've been having it's... a lot of rains around the country. Was it yeah. Kentucky that had oh, all the gosh. flooding? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and in you know when you're driving through these places and you, in the desert and you see these big washes, large, right? large yes. washes, and you and you just think. When when does that ever become a wash? When does it ever get filled with water? Right. And, it's, and it's for about fifteen minutes once a year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it but it gets filled. It does get filled. Yeah. Hey, uh, the nursery. What's happening midsummer? What do you what do you guys uh, what are you selling? Who wants what this time of year? Uh, kind we're of in just, between, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, we're just kind of surviving right yeah. now. I mean, this time of year at the nursery, it's hot. Uh, you're in between planting seasons. Um, you know, a lot of people are just kind of doing little things here and there, maybe planting some shrubs yeah. or, or thing, trees or shrubs right now, even though it might not be the best time of year. But I think this is when people <clears> plan <throat> for that stuff in the summer. They have a bit, of, a bit of time. Yeah. And so they'll do some shrubs and trees. Not a lot of flowers, not a lot of vegetables, maybe some seeds. And, yeah. you know, it's only July. We talk about the heat. August is usually one of the hottest months as well. Yeah. We ain't seen nothing yet. Right. I would right. imagine. See, I usually think September, late yeah. September, October but is it, the it, hottest. It, the beginning is August, the dog days of summer, yeah. as they refer to. Our Tucson friend, Kim, is saying that it's a high of 90 today. Ooh, so beautiful. that's not bad. It's going to be cool. Nice. Yeah. But cool like what Tucson. you were saying, Tiger, she says a 70% chance of rain. Yep. Yeah. Warm rain. It's nice. Hey, it, we uh, got some warm rain yesterday. Did we? I did. Yeah, wow. little drizzle. I like. know that I, you know, I, I walk around the building a couple of times during the day, and it was a little cloudy and a little, a little bit of a breeze. The, the other day, I was coming here to meet Brian, and I just told him around what time I would be there. Uh-huh. And he's just standing out in front of the building, <laughs> waiting. Like, you just waiting for me out here, kind of, like, kind of. But I'm doing my walk. Yeah, do the walk around ten o'clock. <laughs> okay, so uh, we got a couple of minutes until our first break. Tiger, our guest today, will be, and then we'll squeeze in John's quote of the week before the uh, break. We're going to be talking with Adam Colbert. He's a landscape designer, and um, we're going to be talking about how he formulates his landscapes, um, where he starts, um, some exciting plants for him coming into uh, the landscape, and um, just some of the principles, especially, you know, we're talking about all these weather changes that people need to consider whenever they're planting um, to uh, make sure the landscape fits with their climate. So if you have any landscape questions, a perfect time, you can tell us about your area, small area, large area, and then ask Adam questions pertaining to that. Those on Facebook Live, those that are tuned in on BizTalk Radio, Every week we do remind you that uh, you can watch the show live. Go to our Facebook page, Garden America Radio Show. You can interact with the comments on the right-hand side of your computer screen. Uh, Talk to us. Uh, You can talk to other people that are tuned in and also watching. A lot of regulars tuned in, so we do appreciate that. So uh, with that in mind, um, gosh, this is the one time I wish the quote was a little longer, John, due to our timing into the break. But uh, take your time. Go ahead. The quote of the week. Here's well, I thought John it was Begnasco. a perfect quote because of uh, today's guest. So the quote's from Frank Lloyd Wright. Ah. And he said, a doctor can bury his mistakes, but an architect can only advise his clients to plant vines. 
<laughs> See, that's great. Yeah. Little little uh, something to cover up those mistakes, uh, John? Hey, uh, Kim in Tucson says that um, hurricanas and plumerias are blooming like crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was looking at, at I, I think I mentioned this last week, but I was looking at my plumeria, and I've never seen so many blooms. Looks and, good. And I don't know if it's because they're finally in the ground, if that's the reason. Yeah. Uh, but they're, they're just spectacular. They are spectacular. Hey, with that in mind, we're going to take a break. Our first break as we kick things off on this Saturday morning, maybe Saturday afternoon, depending upon where you are. It's good to have you. We are going to take that break, come back with Adam. We're going to be talking about uh, landscape architects or architecture along those lines. Yeah. Tiger? Okay. Architect, architecture. <laughs> anyway, do stay with us as we take a break. I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco. This is Garden America. Okay, we have returned from our break, a short break on uh, Facebook Live, a bit longer on BizTalk Radio. I want to thank uh, Stephanie and the gang. They keep us on the air, BizTalk Radio, and our many uh, fine sponsors and supporters. So with that said, we are uh, smack dab uh, starting off segment number two. I was going to say smack dab in the middle, but we're not. We're just kicking off segment two. So uh, obviously I'm, I'm a bit confused, so I'm going to turn things over to Tiger Palafox. He can bring our <laughs> guest on, Adam, and uh, we'll get this interview and discussion underway, Tiger. Yeah, so this morning we've got Adam Cobert, a landscape architect, joining us to talk about um, the different design principles he puts in place. Adam is a uh, landscape architect that is world-renowned, um, bases here in uh, Newport Beach, but has done designs all over the world and also some of the large resorts in Vegas, uh, hotels in Texas, and many other places. Adam, thank you very much for joining us this morning. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, hey, Adam, you know, when I was looking through your portfolio at all the projects you've done, and I did mention some big uh, projects, but you also do residences as well. Um, you know, I always find landscape architecture architecture uh, amazing because it's almost you know where where do you guys just start you know this vision just comes out of nowhere and you know i i imagine when you start with a clean slate it's probably easier maybe than when you're working with an existing landscape but um what are your thoughts as far as you know if somebody has an existing landscape or is somebody has a clean slate what what's easier what's better what's worse um, you know what? Both have their pros and cons. I mean, you know, obviously when you have a blank slate, you're the, um, you know, you get to set the the vocabulary for the entire site. You get to set the framework. You get to dictate a lot of the direction in the, the design. Whereas if it's an existing, um, you know, where there are existing conditions that, um, you know, it's less of a blank canvas, you know, where you're doing maybe more of a remodel. Um, I always think of those as more of a, a jigsaw puzzle that I just have to figure out because you have, you have components that you have to um, kind of stitch together to make a cohesive design. So in my mind, sometimes those can be a little trickier, um, but, you know, bo both have pros and cons. Yeah. And, you know, you have experience – all over the world doing landscape architecture. And, you know, I imagine that probably is a huge benefit to you in the sense of seeing a, a lot of different areas, a lot of different places, a lot of different styles to be able to kind of make your designs function in ways that maybe people might not recognize. Meaning, you know, if you, if you travel the world looking at different places and then bring that to Texas, 
they might not have ever seen something in Texas before. Do you get that inspiration when you go around? Absolutely. Um, I just got back from Europe, and I, I think traveling is one of the best things that you can do as far as being uh, getting inspiration. And, you know, then that helps me to keep things fresh, um, you know, in the designs that I do wherever they are. Um, you know, there are always the key components, you know, to make a successful design. Um, you know, it's got to function well. It's got to do well in the climate that you're, you know, where you're designing, things like that. But um, as far as traveling and being able to take or absorb, um, you know, what I see and then how that influences and translates into my designs, I think it's always it's always in uh, a state of motion and evolution, um, you know. But yeah, the how how those um, those travels translate into designs wherever they are, um, you know, is is definitely a key component of how I design and how I'm inspired. And now, you know, you and I talked on the phone a while back um, before the interview, and. You, you, we mentioned, you know, traveling and seeing and getting inspiration. And, you know, I want to touch a little bit on the idea that, you know, it's wonderful to get inspiration from when you travel on maybe some hardscape concepts, maybe some overall, overall looks. But people have to be careful with getting too specific and getting too hung up, meaning, you know, if you're on the East Coast and you see this hedge and you just absolutely fall in love with this hedge, and then you live in Tucson, you know, there's a chance that that hedge <laughs> maybe doesn't even exist in Tucson. But, exactly. but but someone like you can maybe help with the design idea that, hey, we don't have this hedge, but there are other things, right? Exactly. And, you know, that's one of the that's one of the very first conversations I have with, a, you know, with a client. You know, it's, you know, just for example, I was working on a project in Mexico. And, you know, we were talking about wanting to do all of these things, and they liked the stuff that, um, you know, that I'd been a part of in, in Las Vegas. And I was saying, well, but that doesn't really translate down here because you don't have the same cli climate, mm -hmm. you know. And so we've got, we've got to adapt. And the other thing is I have to be careful when I design that I um, pay attention to what plants I, I specify or put on the plants because even though the, you know, you can look at the various plants and you can see that, yeah, it, it is okay in this zone or this zone or this zone. It doesn't really matter if it's <laughs> not available yeah. in that particular location or if it's, if it's going to, they're going to have to spend hours and hours and hours or days getting delivery from a nursery to a site that's not very, that's not good for the client. Yeah. So one of the very first things that, um, you know, we discuss is availability and how close things are and how uh, easy are we able to get things, you know, even into a country or into a different state because of, you know, borders, you know, and these restricted, um, these plant lists that are restricted or, you know, States consider certain plants invasive, and so they won't let it cross the border. Yeah, you know, those things. So one of the very first conversations I have is, what is your, um, you know, what do your nurseries look like? You know, do they have the quantities that we're going to need, and what is readily available? And then from there, I start to build a palette of the plant, and then that's how we start with the, you know, the softscape uh, planting design. Yeah, that would be a problem for John, you know, our co-host here, Adam, because he he would never consider borders of plants. Meaning, you know, if he has to order it from a, a, a company in New Zealand and it's going to take six months, he's just going to say, all right, well, we'll just wait six months. And, and if I have to grow, <laughs> grow it from a seed, yeah, I'll it, grow it from it, a seed. Yeah. Exactly. He's we have got to wait the patience. five years for this right. plant to propagate. We'll be good to go. And quantity's <laughs> never a problem because they only use one of each. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Adam, we're going to take I, a... I think some people, they think that sounds great to import. And I and I think, you know, when you can, go for it. I yeah. mean, why not? You know, if yeah. the... The stars align, and you can bring something really spectacular that you can highlight and showcase. Go for it. Yeah. Um, 
Hey, you know, hey, Adam. Hey, Adam, we got to take a quick break. Sorry to cut you off. Um, when we get back, we'll continue talking with Adam Cobert about uh, landscape design. Yes, yeah, so we got a question uh, from Kim also on All Facebook right. Live for Adam. And somebody says, uh, actually, Vanessa says, see you on KUSI at 10, Tiger. So you see, you do have a following on TV. <laughs> All right, uh, that's it. We're going to take a break. Uh, questions, comments for Adam or one of us here, uh, Garden America, feel free. Going to take a break for our friends on Biz Talk Radio. I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco. Welcome to your weekend. Happy Saturday. This is Garden America. Okay, we are back. Thank you for tuning in. Those on uh, Biz Talk Radio, this pre recorded show. Remember, you can catch us live on Facebook. Facebook Live, Garden America Radio Show. Also, our YouTube channel, Garden America Radio Show. Go to our website, GardenAmerica.com. Always things happening there, changing, refreshing, different all the time. We are talking uh, to a landscaper today, Tiger. How about that? Adam, Adam is with <laughs> a us. Landscape a landscape architect, architect, right? Yeah, so we're talking with Adam Cobert, landscape architect. And Adam, um, we do have a couple questions that came across on Facebook real quick. But before we kind of continue our interview, let's hit on these. Um, Kim is asking, when de designing healing gardens in hospital settings, what are your thoughts on fragrance? I think it adds to the sensory brain uh, thoughts as long as not in the allergic load, allergenic load. So I think that, yeah. you know, fragrance is good, but maybe just not too much, maybe not too much of a perfume. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Adam? You know, it's for me, and I don't know whether other people are this way, but you know, the sense of smell is incredibly powerful. Um, to me, it always instantly can trigger a memory, you know, in my mind. Um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, something like cooking or, um, you know, flowers are a great um, uh, example as well. Um, you know, star jasmine. Star jasmine is one of those that has a really fragrant um, scent in the in the spring, and every time I smell it, I always think back to a certain time when I was, I think it was like 22 or 23, um, and I lived at this place in Los Angeles, and there was star jasmine growing everywhere, and so it's like, no matter where I am now, 20 years later, if I smell star jasmine, I'm instantly taken back to that spot, though, and I think that is, um, you know, it's a, it's a delicate balance with scent because sometimes it can be overpowering. And some people um, are kind of averse to that. Um, but for me, I think in small doses um, where it's not overpowering, I think scent can be really powerful. And yeah. so I, I like to promote um, flowers that have a little bit of scent because particularly in resorts, you're always trying to create this. Uh, never-ending sense of discovery mm. as people walk and uh, travel through a property. And, you know, it's easy to always think about what am I designing that's going to be pleasing to the eye. But I think adding that layer of including something that's fragrant, I think is is just something else that, um, you know, gives your, your design some depth. Yeah, and, and I, I think... You know, like I said, the layers of that, you know, whether it's sight or scent, um, you know, I, and even touch, you know, people always want to go up and touch, particularly if they might think you might be pulling a fast one on them and mm -hmm. have some artificial in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They love to touch you know, the plants that look big. And, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I mean, also, you know, nature, plants, flowers, fragrance, they're not forever in the sense of the, the star jasmine. It's very seasonal. So you only get that exactly. for a period of time. You don't get that 12 months out of the year. So exactly. I, I, you, it can kind of come and go. Um, yeah. and, and then I, we have another. And, you know, it, that changes, throughout, like you said, that you change it throughout the year. And that just helps um, also keep your garden constantly refreshed. Mm. Yeah. So it's not the same thing. Um, and then we have another question from one of our listeners, Rick. Do you have a mentor um, when it comes to landscape design? Um, yeah. You know what? Um, the guy that I worked for, I worked for um, this firm, Lifescapes International, and uh, I worked for them for 16 years. And the founder of that 
Don Brinkerhoff um, is probably one of the most you know influential people in my career, um, and he's somebody that I um, have looked up to and um, you know tried to model a lot of how I design after him and the the things that he found important. Um, you know, unfortunately, he passed away last summer, um, but you know, I there are all of these. Um, little ideas and principles that I have picked up through the the many, many years that I had working and traveling with him, and they apply every day in my work. So Don Brinkerhoff is by far probably the most influential um, person as far as my landscape career goes. Okay. Yeah, good to know. Good, good influence then. Um, Adam, the other thing I was going to kind of – uh, mention here now too is the where you start and when we talked about this on the phone um you know you do big projects you know like we talked about hotels resorts uh, large-scale commercial projects but you do homes as well and you know you you said you kind of start a little bit more with the hardscape right right i mean for me and particularly with um you know, and, it, and it, it doesn't matter whether it's commercial or residential. Um, one of the first things I do is I want to visit the site. And I want to visit the site, and I, it's always a good idea to visit the site with the owner um, so that we can walk the site, look at the site. They can explain the history or, you know, certain things that they know about the site. And then they can also explain to me their, their wish list on what they hope to achieve you know, through the process of, um, you know, the design that we're going to hopefully create. Um, you know, so, and in, in visiting the site, you get to see what the site has to offer. Um, you get to see what the pros and cons are. You get to see what, um, because obviously if there's something spectacular that you want to highlight or showcase, you got to, you, you want to um, do a design that does that. Um, if there are some things that aren't so great about your site, you want to design in a way that um, lessens the impact of those cons in um, how the design performs later on. Um, so, you know, I like to look at the, the natural characteristics of the site. Then, you know, if it's a house or a hotel or any other surrounding architecture, I like to see how that affects it. Um, and then, um, you know, I look for big trees or changes in topography. Um, you know, once you have those kinds of building blocks or parameters or borders, then you know how you can start to situate and, uh, you know, lay out your design. So for me, the most important thing is how does the site function? You know, you can bring in the the craziest or the most beautiful plant material ever but if the if the site isn't laid out so that it's easy to maneuver through or if the site isn't laid out so that it um, functions in a way that is um, what the client is hoping to, to get then um, all of that other stuff doesn't matter so the first thing to me is you got to get your layout right you got to get Basis to feel comfortable um because if they're not comfortable people won't use it it's people it's fun- won't want to be there it's funny that you kind of use that description as far as when you start because you i asked you to share a couple um uh, highlights of of yours and you know one of the first ones that you shared were the channel gardens at the rockefeller center and i just shared a link to their fa- their um <laughs> their website um to show you know what what we're talking about if people are online um, and I mean, talk about a, a site, you know, you're in a, a plaza surrounded by nothing but concrete and yeah. buildings. It's very gray. <laughs> and um, you had to go in there and figure out that layout, that design and bring in these trees and, and shrubs and things that somehow work with the site. And not only that, you're probably dealing with, you know, one of the busiest places on earth when it comes to traffic and access and everything else. Right. Right. I mean, that's a that's a, a tricky project, and it's it's one that you know I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, 
that that channel gardens you know it's the it's the corridor between fifth avenue and the ice skating rink it's it's the you know when you see the shot uh you know on the news or whatever you know of the the rockefeller christmas tree they always you know do that shot through that channel and the channel is original from 1934 when rock center was built and it over time it became um known as kind of uh, a place for um you know, it became kind of a thematic showcase garden and or show garden. And so, um, you know, I had the opportunity to work on it for you know, two or three years. I think I, I did um, 26 different designs that they change out um, every six to eight weeks. Um, you know, and you the bones of the. Hey, hey, Adam, I'm so sorry to cut you off again. We have to uh, break. All right, now for a commercial break. When we get back, we'll continue chatting with Adam Colbert. On this very same topic, a couple of questions uh, have come to mind as well. So uh, do stay with us. We're going to take a break, continue with Adam, talking about uh, landscaping. Uh, John Bagnasco, I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox Fox here. We are Garden America, taking a break for Biz Talk Radio. Coming back a bit quicker for those on Facebook Live. This is Garden America for your weekend. Do stay with us. All right, if you are tuned in on uh, BizTalk Radio, this is the final segment leading up to the top of the hour. News coming up. We're back at six minutes after. We do hope you carry uh, both hours, at least one of those hours. Anyway, back at live here on Facebook and uh, pre-recorded on BizTalk Radio, talking about landscape architecture with Adam and had to take a break. Tiger, let's get back into it and pick up, and then I've got a couple of questions as well. All right. Yeah, I'm so sorry for cutting you off right there, Adam. You were in the middle of talking about the Channel Gardens at the Rockefeller Center and in what they were, and so, you know, the, the access that people have to them and also um, the function of them. Um, so if you can pick up right where you left off, thank you very much. Yeah, so, you know, the, like I said, the, the garden itself is, has been there from since the, you know, the, since they opened the center, you know, so it's from 1934. It's a series of six fountains, you know, with um, beds, along the sides that they have benches and things. And that's where people sit as they, they come and tour. But so always having to create a new design, I had to fit it within, you know, that, those boundaries, those, those planters that are built that had been there since 1934. So, you know, it's, you know, we've talked, you know, we talked about the, the pros and cons about a blank slate versus something where you have um, an existing site. This was interesting because it was kind of where, I had a, I had a an existing site with you know set built planters. I have these six fountains that I have to design around, but then they're like, but whatever you want to do outside of that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, then it's like, so what can you think up? Yeah. And so new trees, you know they and they want each each change to be completely different. You know, and so all of the trees are brought in and then removed. So they only they're only in there for six to eight weeks. Wow. Um, the same with all of the shrubs. So you'll you'll have hydrangeas in there, and then the you know the next day we did a change out through the middle of the night because they want to change it. Um, the change goes from nine in the evening till nine in the morning. Wow! And they they'll close down a lane at Fifth Avenue. They have the trucks um, pulled up quickly unloaded onto the sidewalk and then they have probably 30 30 guys that help change this garden out within uh, you know 12 hours wow. but but it's interesting because we can go from a, a garden that has hydrangeas you know the night before and the next morning when people arrive there are palm trees and, <laughs> it, and you know it, it, it's it's stuff like that so you know that's a really interesting um, example that you brought up because you know like I said, the bones were there, yeah. but then outside of that, you know, it's a blank slate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got a, yeah, a quick question for, for you, it. Adam, uh, speaking along these lines here. So you're, you're doing these projects smack dab in the middle of the city. Uh, we're talking about New York City. You've got cars, you've got traffic, you've got pollution. How does that affect your decision on what to plant in terms of plants and uh, trees surviving in that kind of environment as opposed to out in the country or someplace where you don't have traffic and pollution? You know, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, the plants, 
don't seem to have a, a big problem with the pollution. You know, I think that, um, you know, and that's not always the case, but uh, plants are pretty resilient. I think the, what, for me, the biggest problem with plants is um, people being too rough on them, people touching them, people, you know, getting too close. You know, I, I, I'm always the guy that goes up and touches plants and, mm-hmm. you know, I, you know, I, I always want to investigate. And I think that's the way people are naturally. Um, and to me, I, I find that humans are the hardest on the plant in <laughs> those kinds of settings because everyone's, you know, you're not out in the country where it's open. You know, everyone is in, the, are in these tighter spaces uh, when you're in an urban setting. So in my mind, humans are kind of the, one of the hardest things for um, plants. So I always try to pick plants that I think are durable, um, that can handle backpacks being smashed into them, into them, <laughs> and can handle kids climbing um, on people, them. kids falling <laughs> into them, and stuff like that. So yeah. you, um, the one thing you know, when it comes to retail, retail or um, commercial settings, you often or I always think about I need to make sure that um, plants are not going to create something that's a dangerous situation so i often will try to steer away from um you know cactus mm-hmm. or things that have spine um you know because nobody wants to get crucified you know, literally <laughs> yeah yeah definitely not for uh, a, a friendly landscape right for an unfriendly <laughs> landscape it's okay but not yeah. for not for an inviting landscape um, are there any more questions, Brian? Yeah, Adam, just one more question. I know, John, we've got questions on Facebook as well. Adam, my last question to you is, in these kind of situations, do they leave it up to you? Or do they say, look, we want one of these, we want a tree here, we want this? Do they say, just make it work, Adam? In other words, totally up to your creativity. Or do you have to kind of go back and forth? Um, it just depends. Um, in general, um, I always do... Create create a palette that um, that you know takes everything into consideration. It's not very often that I'll have um, a client say we want this particular plant or we want you to use these particular trees. Um, usually, they want me to just design for what's best for that particular um, environment and also what's best for that particular program for their site. So it's not often that I have people specifically request a certain thing. Um, they may, they may um, show me photographs of things that they like um, to use as, as kind of a jumping off point to, you know, as they try to convey their idea to me. Yeah. But um, that's kind of how I, that's typically how my process goes with clients is that, um, you know, they feed me things that they like, and then I come back to them um, with potential solutions that I think are going to work well. Tiger, we've got about a, about a minute before our break here. Yeah, so um, was, were there any more questions? I don't know. John there are started. several other questions if we can hold yeah, Adam okay. over another segment. Sure. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, right now, before I break, Adam, I'm just going to let you know I'm going to be posting onto the feed also the other location, just so people are aware, um, that Adam really, I would say, either enjoyed how the design came out or enjoyed working on the project was a the Hotel Drover in, um, was it Fort Worth? Adam? Fort Worth. Yeah. yeah. Fort Worth so I'm going to be there. sharing that gallery as well. But when we get back from our break, we'll continue talking with right. Adam. Um, and we'll be talking landscape design. Yep, do stay with us. And, of course, uh, John's got some questions on Facebook he's going to read. So, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, those on BizTalk Radio, you carry the second hour because that's what we're going to be diving into. Back at uh, six minutes after those on BizTalk Radio, news coming up top of the hour. And, again, those watching us and listening on Facebook, we're going to be back even sooner than that. So, again, Adam, thank you for holding over. We are going to take that break. As we mentioned, news coming up, BizTalk Radio, back on Facebook Live. This is Garden America, Brian Main, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palace. Fox every weekend right here with Garden America. We are back. If you're tuned in on BizTalk Radio, this is the start of hour number two. Hopefully you got to listen 
to our number one. Those on Facebook Live, thank you for those questions, your comments. We're going to dive into those. Our guest today, Adam, uh, talking landscape. He's a landscape architecture, so any questions along those lines as well. Uh, John, you want to kick things off, and uh, then we'll bring Adam up and uh, continue our talk. You know, I was, I was thinking when I was in Indiana a few weeks ago, we were at the Dunes uh, State Park at the southern en- end of Lake Michigan, and you're talking about uh, landscape design in certain <laughs> areas. They had a, a huge raised planter bed. With, it looked like native trees in it, but the ground cover was poison ivy <laughs> with benches all around it. Oh, wow. Oh. So, yeah. People walk away from there feeling yeah, stay good. Away, uh, stay away. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was talking about, I talked about cactus. I guess I should have mentioned poison ivy. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's see, Gina up in uh, Idaho wants to know if you have, uh, and this is, I guess, a lot of homeowners would have the same type of question, you know, maybe people with uh, quarter-acre lots to half-acre lots. She wants to know if you have any tips on how to create garden rooms or how to divide up the garden and create points of interest. Um, It depends, you know, you got to look at your space. Um, And one of the best Thing, ways that I divide up the spaces with vertical elements. Um, I always tell clients um, where we can and where we should, um, we need to put trees. Um, and trees are one of the best ways to break up your space and to, you know, create these outdoor rooms. Vertical elements, um, you know, that's the best way that I break up, um, you know, rooms or spaces. They also help you... Um, you know, as you maneuver through your garden, they help you to create this never-ending sense of discovery that I think is important and keeps people interested as they maneuver through your, your garden. So um, for me, I go to trees first. I try to um, encourage clients to go for the big trees because having big trees um, it's basically um, a way of you're buying time. You know, trees grow slow for the most part. And so if you can put the bigger trees, if you can spend the money to buy and um, install the bigger trees, that's going to make your garden feel older and more, um, more finished. And then after, after you have your trees set, then I, I, I look at um, – you know, what kind of hardscape element could you include that are vertical that help um, break up your space? Whether you're doing, um, you know, garden walls or uh, a, a lattice or something like that. I think those are, those are other um, good components. Um, and also, I think a good old-fashioned hedge is another way to break up a space if, it, if it's, you know, good for the environment or good for the the garden itself. Yeah, yeah. Good, good points. Good points, definitely. Yeah. Uh, did we have anything else, John? Or- uh, well, Kim in Tucson has a question, and she thinks it's a little bit off topic, but she was just wondering if Adam might know. She says that she loves to see what happens to the gardens that people design. And she says as a nurse and a gardener, she's interested in garden therapy, and she wants to know if you're aware of any programs to that you could receive certificates from, certification? I will be completely honest in that I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's not something I know about. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she did say it was a little off topic, (laughs) but uh, I think you've impressed uh, with our listeners the fact that you might know everything, so that's why she asked. Exactly. And And that is the shortest answer all morning. That's good. And uh, I will say that Adam's garden therapy is probably more from a um, – aspect where he's trying to um uh create an environment where you have people that are enthusiastic about being there and um inspired by what they see because you know the gardens that you've done adam and the inspiration that you have from traveling you know definitely comes across in your designs and i did share adam's website on our facebook yep. feed if people want more information to be able to reach out to him or to be able to see what kind of work he's done. Because as he mentioned, it's always good to see what other people have done to maybe get your own inspiration. Mm -hmm. 
It's always a great uh, starting point. And Adam, um, I want to thank you very much for joining us this weekend. I know we had to, you know, carry you over from a, a couple weeks back. So thanks for staying with sure. us. And um, we look forward to following your progress and seeing more projects that come along the re- along your way. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a great rest of the weekend and take care. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Yep. Take care. So, so let yeah. me ask you, John. You're going to landscape now. You, <laughs> you, this is hypothetical. Yeah. So we, we, you have ideas and stuff. Are you the kind of guy that don't let, don't let my wife hear that it's hypothetical? <laughs> are you the, are you the kind of guy that would let's say you're going to hire somebody like Adam? Are you the kind of guy that would say, "Look, just tell me what kind of plants are going to work for my environment. I've got a few ideas, but basically just just go for it." No, or no. you'd be more involved, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would never I, hire would, anyone like yeah. Adam. <laughs> nobody nobody would ever design right, Adam, John's Adam, landscape. Right, Adam would never even work with me. Yeah, <laughs> but, but again, that's why it's hypothetical because. I'm the kind of person that we. I've got some ideas, but I would want to know what's going to grow best here. Yeah. Okay, you're the expert. And then as far as that goes, draw something up. Let me look at it. Because I know that in my job, I like to, you know, you, you're you hiring yeah. me to create a commercial. Right. Okay. You, I know you have ideas as a client, but I think I know best how to how to bring that message across. Much like Adam, you know, he's got the vision. We've all got visions. But, you know, you may have a vision. He's going to say, you know what? The weather's not right. Um, these plants aren't going to be with you know all year round. They're yeah. deciduous. They're not deciduous. Well, I mean, like you, you, we were talking earlier about commercials. You know exactly the words that need to be in a commercial and words that don't need to be in a commercial. Exactly. And when it comes to commercials, it's about time and getting your point across, right? Yeah, Absolutely. And if, and, and and if you're le- wasting time, right. and if you're wasting time on words that don't need to be in your commercial, absolutely, you're 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 cutting yourself short because you're losing time to convey your message and and people's attention span you know right. you used to hear a lot more 60 second commercials you don't anymore yeah it's 5 15 or 30 <laughs> if you can't get your point across in the first couple of sentences yeah then you know I'm, I'm sorry but i, I deal with this but, all the time but but that's your profession right and so right. where someone like adam who's a landscape architect right. comes into place is like exactly what you think be, or exactly what you're saying someone that doesn't have the experience the knowledge the the vision for their backyard or their front yard you know he can come in there and say well you know i i think you're going to want this you have kids you're going to want this all you don't things. have kids you have this where john's problem is he's a collector so he just wants to have a place for his collection yeah you know it's it's almost john's, john's john, more like a museum well i was just going to say john is a museum he's got yes. a bunch of walls mm-hmm. and now he's got to figure out how he's going to arrange his collection on these walls he's not necessarily concerned it, we're, we're talking like he's not here no he's not um yeah. <laughs> i don't are you concerned with presentation not so much right well you know at my old house i had half an acre yeah yeah and it was there were plants everywhere, and it all looked good and all yeah. flowed together. But I, I would say that I did not have more than one plant of any type yeah, on right. that whole half an acre. Yeah, which which was cool. Yeah, because oh, what's this? Oh, what's that? It wasn't like oh, you got ten of those, five. But it of those. worked. But it really did. It work. did work. Yeah, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's a challenge to put uh, put things together so that. So it gives you a cohesive, you know, there's a difference between a vision and just seeing things. Which, no, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, um, and, I, and I think that, that you can do that. You can be, remember, Tiger, it's not, um, not hoarding if it's plants. <laughs> so it's a, even if you have any type of collection, uh, no matter what it is, you want to present it so yeah. pe- other people can see it and maybe – feel why you appreciate this so much and you can do that with all kinds of things i mean if it's starbucks mugs you know you want to want to you you don't want them just in a drawer somewhere if you're collecting them you want people to be able to see them like these mic mic flags right here with these various stations right i mean i didn't put a whole lot of thought into that i just put them up there no but they're in a way that people can see them they're in the center of the room so you're aware that they're there and you you mentioned the the mugs or or something like that. Right. You know, it's like your library. Right. You know, when you walk into your library, you could easily have a bunch of blank shelves. That's one way to do it. So you see the books. Um, you can put them behind doors. But then if you put them behind doors without windows, then you can't see which books are in it. Right. And then the lighting. 
where it shines on the book so you can actually see the collection and read and all of that. We're going to take a break real quick, Tiger. Oh, darn it. I know, but you've got a lot more to say. Don't lose your thought. <laughs> no, don't use the, uh, lose that train of thought. Uh, keeping up on uh, Biz Talk Radio, i got to keep the breaks uh, for our network friends right where they are. We're not going to deviate or try not to. So that said, we're going to take a quick break for Biz Talk Radio and uh, Facebook Live. Brian Main, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. Do stay with us. A lot more coming. And again, your questions, your comments on Facebook Live. Okay, we are back from the break, a bit longer on BizTalk Radio, but I do want to thank those uh, tuned in on BizTalk Radio uh, for supporting our show, supporting our sponsors, and again, the good folks uh, at BizTalk Radio who keep us on the air. We do appreciate that. Stephanie, et cetera, et cetera. All right, that said, we had to interrupt Tiger, much like we do our guests every now and then <laughs> when we have to take a hard break here for BizTalk Radio. So, uh, Tiger, do you remember where you were and what you were talking about? Yeah, I was about? talking about John's library yeah, and yeah. how it's not just a bunch of books set up they're they're displayed and to a lot of ways that's a, all arranged a, by topic too y- it, you have them arranged in your in your way and that's like his landscape in the sense of there's going to be a design to it that shows off what he has um but for the most part it's also about being able to coordinate what he has and have it be functional but to not necessarily has. for us or for those that are going to be watching or looking at the books but the way he wants it. yeah or not necessarily less roses because he already has too many <laughs> you know so he's he's got to leave room for more roses how many roses is too many there is none right yeah John? there I is none haven't sure. seen that yet yeah. i'm still pulling plants out of the dumpster that people throw away yeah. I'm like what are you doing um so um if if we're on to be able to change topic yes or no yes absolutely okay so i did set up a new shot here for people that are watching on facebook live and for most people, will recognize the one plant behind the bag of mosquito bits as a spider plant. You you instantly right recognized oh, it absolutely. when it came in. Um, spider plants are great house plants, very uh, good at reproduction. Um, but this is Bonnie Bonnie Curl Bonnie Curl, I think, or it's a curled leaf spider plant. So unlike the uh, standard spider plant, it stays a little bit more controlled, a little smaller in size. Um, but it still has a cool variegation, and it still does reproduce. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can move these little leaf. No, the what, what would you call these runners, John? Uh, on the runners, spider plants, right. runners. You yeah. mean the these little, little baby spiders? Yeah, the little baby spiders and they coming have off. Little um, the offsets or or uh, what do you call the new plants? Plantlets at the end of the yeah. Day. So um, just like the other spider plant, but. As you can see, these ones are a little bit Just more... like Bermuda grass, but a little nicer. <laughs> yeah, a little nicer, a little easier to control, too. Right. Um, so, you know, spider plants are fun because they give you a cool-looking houseplant, but at the same time, you can have fun with, if you're a novice gardener, on plant reproduction in the sense of being able to just all you have to do is kind of trim those off plant them yeah and they regrow right yeah they're very easy you, you said very 70s I, in the 70s right? we had two or three of those hanging in the house everywhere not i, I see 70s variety. What's no. that? not this, this, no, not new, this, this variety. new variety this, the curly ver- the, what'd you call yeah. it curly bonnie curl I bonnie think. curl no uh but the other spider plant that john and i are referring to it's similar but this this is different i told oh. you before that somebody told me that uh, where they were from, they called it the bad baby plant. Yeah, that's right. The bad baby plant. Yeah, because the, what we refer to as the little spider parts, right. they say, you know, you've got the main plant, the mother plant, and then all the babies running, running away. away. So bad baby. I like that. Yeah, I like that name. That's a super plant. funny one. I'm impressed by how deep green those leaves are. That, yeah, that looks a, like a very healthy plant. It's a very healthy looking plant. It's very, um, I like this coloration too. Unlike... Some of the other spider plants that maybe the variegation isn't as uh, prominent. This mm-hmm. one looks really nice. Now, d- you have this hanging someplace, I assume? No, I brought it in because today, uh, <laughs> KUSI. I don't know if he can take it. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're, you're going to be on TV this morning. I'm going to be on TV again this morning, and this topic, uh, this morning's topic will be houseplants and how to transplant them, take care of them, all of that good stuff. To which I say, that that's all fine. You're promoting the show, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, but um, I brought in the bag because we have um, 
Bill Stingle to join us often from Summit Chemicals. Right. And he talks about mosquito dunks and mosquito bits. And so we were talking about houseplants, and I'm going to mention the mosquito bits because as we talk about with Bill, the mosquito bits are excellent for the control of um, fungal gnats in houseplants. You know, usually oh, when people good. are overwatering, yep. they get those little gnats that fly around the plant. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, you just cut back on the watering and they'll go away. And they will. But it's sometimes, the flannel day. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you're right. You have to find that balance between underwatering, overwatering, and fungal gnat issues. And the bits will help control it. And also, the fungal gnat issue is a little bit like white fly. Once you have it, it's oh, kind of yeah. hard to get rid of. Right. But if you can prevent from having it, you're good to go. Is that like fruit flies in your kitchen. Well, that you just remove all the fruit, right? The, yeah, the but, rotting fruit. Or, or you know, you know what works, you know, because it's always our bananas. You know, oh yeah, yeah. It, it is you. You put vinegar in a bowl. And uh-huh. You poke holes and put the saran wrap over it. It works. They go into they the go bowl. In, the next and... day you look and you got a bunch of them in there. Yeah, oh. and Dana handles that. That that's her deal. See, yeah. I because I was I skeptical would never about that. Think that you would get fungus gnats on or fruit flies on your bananas because you always eat them green. You never let them ripen. See, yeah. that's not true. That's not true. Green to you. Yeah. Green to you. You know, I like them. It's funny because Danny won't eat them once they're like too sugary or overripe. Oh, yeah. They're not green, but but probably I like them a little you less like ripe than John green. does, so, but they're not like green. On the so, green side. so Brian likes them when you peel it. It actually is hard no, to no. peel. It's no, no. It's crunchy. <laughs> no, I don't. I, do, I don't. But, but there's that, you know, there's that sweet spot in the life of a banana. Where it's ripened Last, up, like, three hours. It's ripened up. It's soft, <laughs> and it's not too sugary. But the next few days, then it's overripe. You, yeah. you got to pin. That's why when I buy bananas, I buy a bunch of green ones, and then a couple, two or three that are ripe. Eat For those your first instant ones, and let the ones ripen up. But I, but John is right in the sense that he likes them overripe. Not overripe. Well, yeah. Well, you're you're like, accusing me of liking them green when you when the when the skin just dis- skin, like disintegrates them. You know off of it. When you bite into a green banana. It's got that yeah. you know, greenish taste. Yeah. It's yeah. terrible. That's that's but that's the way you eat. No, them. I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. We're gonna take this discussion outside oh, after the right. show is what yeah. we're gonna do. Yeah. Hey, whatever happened to this not having any more bananas too? I mean, remember wasn't that the big story a few years ago that was it Cavendish? Cavendish banana? There was a disease yeah. that was affecting all the plantations, and since we only planted Cavendish banana. Ban- Cam- Cavendish is the dwarf banana, isn't which, it? Which one is the? I think it was the dwarf banana that we're talking about. Yeah. We're, we're, no. And and there was a disease that was wiping out all the plantations, and they were going to say, "Oh well, in so many years there just won't be any more bananas anymore because of this problem." You know? Did you ever? We still have a lot ever, of bananas. I know. I I still feel like there's. And one of the benefits of climate change was that it heated <laughs> up the temperature and burned out. It the burned disease. out the disease. Yeah. yeah. One of the benefits. Uh, hey, let's catch up on. Um, oh, questions. Some questions here. All right. You got um, in front of you? I don't see any other questions. Yeah? Need help? Let me see. Well, did you answer Rick's? Did we answer? Was I not paying attention oh, to Rick's question? Tanya has a uh, comment here. She says, uh, great minds. I oh, yeah? Is, I hope that's not because of a sarcastic comment because of our banana Oh, no, we're having fun. Conversation. <laughs> um, anyway, she said, um, I love those ideas, too. I have a very nice gardening book with many photos, a garden for all seasons, which is her initial inspiration for a garden of bloom all year round. She's excellent. up in San Jose. Yes, she is. Where you can have a garden that blooms all year round. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're in the cold climates and you've got seasons, you can enjoy each season, but there's not going to be any year-round gardening other than... No can do, <laughs> right? Right, other than looking at the bones of the garden during the winter. We're going to take a break here to stay on our network timing. So uh, do stay with us. We have two more segments coming up. Plenty of time for your questions, your comments on Facebook. If we do happen to miss your question, your comment, go ahead and uh, uh, retype it again, and we will certainly get to you. Break time. Garden America, Brian Maine, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox, do stay with us. And thank you for joining us here on Garden America and the BizTalk Radio Network.
banana bread. All right, we are back talking about ripe bananas. And uh, when is it time to make banana bread with your ripe bananas? Yeah, right. That is talking the, about the ripe bananas. burning question. Are you getting bananas from yours? Yeah, I'm just I'm, so I think mine are plantains, and I'm just uh, not a huge fan of my bananas on my tree. John so calls I don't really, those dinosaur eggs. I don't really focus on trying to harvest them or eat you them. You can't eat plantains. No, you have to you cook them. You've got to cook them. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and I just have been motivated to cook my bananas. But you know what would be good is just a little brown sugar, cook them. That'd be good. Hey, Brian, here's a tip from Colleen yeah, for you. I just saw that. Go ahead, yeah, John. Read she that said for she us. read somewhere that if you break the bananas apart from the bunch, they don't ripen as quickly. Oh. It seems to be working for her. Yeah. You know what? That's, we'll try that. That's, that's, uh, that's a good just point. Keep them all in separate yeah. corners of the kitchen. The other thing you can do is if you have a fruit bowl and you have apples in the bowl, you put some of the bananas on, break them apart, put them on top of the apples, and then the others outside the bowl. And the ones on top of the apples will ripen quicker. And after you eat those, then you can go to the that's other like, ones. That's like an apple in a brown bag and an avocado, right? Put the apple in there to help the avocado ripen up? See, I don't know about avocados. You know, we... Ethylene gas or whatever it is? is we that... talked about the avocado where, you know, it was... Uh, what was it? It was... Not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> too late, not too late. Yet. Too late. Now, oh, yeah. too late. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, exactly. that's true. The only thing, yeah, the other, is guacamole, because then you just need them soft, and it's okay. <laughs> yeah, See, I just squeeze the avocado. If it seems soft enough to me, it's ready to go. I, I think you're not supposed to put them in the refrigerator, but after they start to get soft, I put them in the refrigerator, sure. and they hold for a long time. Yeah, they hold longer, right? I'm yeah. going to break the bananas apart. Try that. Yeah. That was like the uh, the great tip we got for the uh, keeping the algae out of the fountain. Oh, yeah. The hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, you really wow. like that. It worked. Yeah. It worked. And safe for birds and other little critters that come by and want to take a drink. Tiger, you should replace some of your bananas. I yeah. have that. Uh, if you want to borrow the book from my library, Bananas of the World. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be in the yeah. B section. There's about, there's over 100 different varieties. Oh, right. And a lot of them are. Are available, but there's some really cool ones like rhino horn, which gets to be two feet long. <laughs> oh goodness! <laughs> and a two foot long banana. Two foot long. Does banana. it come on bunches? Not not huge bunches. And it I takes three say. people to peel it all yeah. at once. Yeah. You get on that side. You get on that side. But if you want smaller bananas, in a lot of them, there's one called Thousand Fingers. Oh wow! Which those are huge, uh, huge bunches. Bunches, yeah, yeah. But little tiny bananas. Yeah, I should dig out some of mine and replace them with actual. Bananas. Hey, That'd John, give us your theory real quick on organic bananas and how funny that is. <laughs> well, I don't Way know if it's funny. I, I would <laughs> never buy an organic banana. And because? Because they cost more than regular ones, and you don't eat the skin anyway. You that, peel it right off. That's exactly my point. You're not eating the skin. You're going to peel yeah. it off anyway. <laughs> so You're supporting the idea of organic do you know? Farming, do you know how many different Brian. meanings that – organic has to various people you know it's like what's organic to you well it wasn't sprayed with bad stuff what's organic to you well it was the way it was grown what's organic to you the climate you know so you throw this word out there and you got to be very careful what does it what does that actually mean yeah yeah well there's a lot of organic poisons out there too there you yeah. go so just because right? it's organic doesn't necessarily mean mean right. good now here's an organic poison what's it mean it won't kill you quite as quick <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. Or, or yeah, or it'll kill you quicker. Oh, did we get all the questions answered? Well, there's one there's question one more, that right? I have no idea how to read that. that oh. That's from Babu. Uh-oh. You need the translate function? Yeah, it's one of those where we need to, not to translate, it's one we need to delete. I don't know if you can delete that oh, okay. off the Facebook feed. All right. I don't know how to do that. Babu. There's another <laughs> Seinfeld reference. You know what? I'm. Uh, okay, we're up to date on the questions, John. I okay, sure. I'm trying to um, send rose stems off to be budded, like I did last year when I came and got green planted from you. Was that last year? Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Wow. And uh, and it worked. I was so happy that that the end yeah, result was good. Yeah, we sold it in the auction. I think for over a hundred dollars, right? Did I get my cut? <laughs> I don't think no, I, I came to yours and got the cut. Oh, okay. Cutting. Talk about that later but, on. But um, well. 
anyway, it also took Nimbus, and Nimbus did not grow. It started, and then it just died. So I need Nimbus. another Nimbus. That Nimbus. <laughs> Do you have Nimbus? It's not blooming right now, but I have it. Does it have an old flower bud on it? A faded flower? I have to double check. I know that's a couple, the kind of stem I need. A couple of them do. Um, is it lemon spice? I think does, but you don't want that one. No, you want Nimbus. I want Nimbus. What a Nimbus! Well, go home and check. Okay, and see. And if it is, just for, leave it. Bring me in a cutting next week. Okay. You can send me, text me a picture, and I'll You'll look know. at I'll it. I'll just text you a picture of the plants. Yeah, what and do you I'll want? just say yes. What do you yes want? Yes or no? Plant? Lila uh, Tiger says that she has a blue Java banana. I saw that. She says it tastes wonderful, and it's also called ice cream banana. I have had that one, and it is the delicious banana. They sell those in the store sometimes. Blue yes, Javas? They do. do they really? Yeah. Well, yeah. they call them ice, ice cream, cream in the stores. And the the awesome thing about that is she's in like Poway? East County, Sandy Poway, Poway, right? Poway, yeah. right. And, you know, I mean, yeah, that's tough to grow bananas out there. It gets cold in the wintertime where they get all damaged and wind right. wind whipped. And, right. and then in the summertime, they get all wind whipped and hot, too. So the fact that she has some bananas growing, wonderful little microclimate somewhere out mm-hmm. in her yard. Great job. Great job. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What's my the matter? Ba- my battery's not charging. Oh. Oh, boy. Uh, only um, 8% is left. I'm so gonna to, I'm going to have to leave in just a few seconds. <laughs> I do want to reply to Rick's comment. He said, I would think that new housing being built nowadays is more concerned about patio design rather than landscape design since backyards are so small, more hard scrape rather than plants. And um, I will say that I see that trend happening a lot where people are having more living walls, more potted plants. And we see that and we talk about it because we talk about compact plants, you know, whether it's vegetables or shrubs, a lot of a lot of companies are creating these more compact plants that do well in containers because people don't have the the yards that they, you know, used to have. Um, So yeah, Rick, I agree that I think as an industry, we are moving more towards a container or compact growing environment. But, you know, on my road trip that I took this summer where we traveled through California, Arizona, Utah, and Nevada, I'm still shocked about how much land there really is. Right? Wide open spaces. I know. Wide open. There's a lot of room out there. Yeah. That you can either see when you're driving in cross country, or yeah. even when you fly across country, you look down, and you go, there's nobody or anything down there. Yeah. There's a lot and, of room, isn't there? You know, and I get it. You know, we have our major cities, you know, our metropolitan areas, and that's fine, but there is a lot of space still out there. I'll so. tell you what, drive through Texas sometimes. <laughs> well, remember, we've talked about, if you took all the people in the world, put them side by side, they would fit in the state of Texas. Yeah, yeah, I think crazy. we did talk about that. Yeah, right. Yeah, That's wouldn't have any billion, elbow room, but seven they, billion people. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So yeah, so um, you know, off topic, but yeah, Rick, a lot of more uh, compact design elements, compact plants are are in our industry for sure. So I agree with that comment about yeah. building nowadays. Well, Andrew, that was our guest, right? Adam. 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 I'm sorry. It begins uh, with an A. So. One of the points he brought up that was important was vertical elements. Mm-hmm. Even in a small garden, you know, anytime you can get something vertical, um, it, it helps a lot. Yeah. Dana uh, mentioned that uh, I was talking about grapes, and she said they're selling cotton candy grapes in the stores. Ooh. Dana was the first one that made us aware or made me aware of Envy Apples. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which right. were from New Zealand. So she's up on her produce. You know, when she goes in that produce, it's like she's on a mission. <laughs> I mean, I can't talk to her. I mean, she's like zoned in, picking this, putting that back, wrapping yeah. that up. What about this? What about that? I'm going to return those apples because they taste mealy. These weren't what I wanted. I'm like, okay. Well, there's yeah, a, she's on a mission. Trust there's me. a lot going on with grape hybridizing now yeah. and cotton candy. Is uh, they look like uh, uh, a green seedless grape, right? But extremely sweet. And Dana mentions they're expensive, but they're yeah. worth it. Yeah. You know what I'm a little skeptical of is lately this past year or so is like year-round blueberries, year-round fruit that used to be seasonal, right? And it's like, wait a second, that's been on the shelf for seven months. 
what what are they doing? Huh? <laughs> you know, I'm very skeptical when it's. I know that it's out of season and they're still. When selling. we were little, you yeah, had but... a month that you could buy blueberries, and yeah. that was it. That was it. Now they're twelve months a year. Yeah, yeah but that's because but... they get them from other parts of the right country and world. And right. you know, we just talked about it that now they're creating varieties that are more ever bearing right. you know more right not not such a one season plant we're going to take a break it's our Darn final it. break one more segment coming up here on facebook live biz talk radio do stay with us brian main john bagnasco tiger pella fox back after these messages our good friends on biz talk radio Okay, we are back. Uh, quick show, good show. I want to thank oh. Adam for being on uh, our show today, Facebook Live and Biz Talk Radio, talking about uh, architecture, architect, landscaped, uh, landscaper, and uh, we learned a lot this morning. So uh, this is it, our final segment, Biz Talk Radio. Tiger Tiger's holding up a bottle. Yeah, he can't even um, wait till after the show. Oh, you He's know what it is? It's, right it's water in a gin bottle. That's what that is. <laughs> no, yeah. that's actually gin from uh, Lance Walheim, right? Yeah, yeah. Our good friend Lance um, sent us some samples of his gin that he created with his. What was it called again, Brian? Do you remember the burr? His um. The, is it on the, the? Is it on the bottle? Bergamot, bergamot sour orange. And just to let people in on something, before Tiger goes on TV, he takes a couple of shots of gin every time, which is why he's so relaxed and comfortable on set. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, that is from Lance, and he did promise he would send a bottle, and he did. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I don't know if you – can you smell yet, John? <laughs> can you smell hey, or John, no? John, can you smell Probably yet? Probably not. No? Can you smell that? Careful. I can so smell I, something. Yeah? Yeah. Can you hand it to Brian? Kind of citrusy. Yeah. Let me see. So yeah, this was the gin that our, our friend uh, Lance worked on creating with his. I, I can smell oranges. it, but it doesn't smell as pungent as regular gin. I guess it does smell kind of fruity. Yeah. Yeah. See. There's notes of fruit. Hmm. That's it's less junipery than most gins. Uh, it's because it's gin much is more flavored with yeah. juniper berries. Right? right. Exactly. And so this is um. Much more of a uh, citrus, which, you know, it's funny in gym, and, and I brought my own lime as well, but I Look forgot to. Look at this. He um, saved this for the last segment, didn't tell us. Yeah. Breaking out the lime, opening up the gym. Exactly. Well, now I got to go to TV. Animal. Now I got to go to TV, go on right? TV. And, um, but, um, you know, so thank you very much, Lance, and we'll make sure to share this on, um, you know, and then um, I'll, I'll, I'll find the information again, but you can, you can only get it right now up in um, – I think it was a Tascadero. At um, let me see if it says because he's on the now bottle. in Oregon and he used to be in a Tascadero, right, John? In that area, yeah, the I Central Coast Distillery. I wasn't Distillery. here the days that you guys we were... interviewed him. I was yeah on vacation. Oh, it was a great show. Yeah, nobody was drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so but, how um, did you? He doesn't mail order. You can't. No, mail he's. Order they're alcohol. working on it right now. Oh, are they? So so soon you will be able to mail order. But oh. for now, it's at Central Coast Distillery in a Tascadero. And, um, you know, so if you're interested in a fun new gin, take a look at the Walheim Ranch uh, Bergamot Sour Orange Gin. Try it out. Mm -hmm. um, I will attest that it tastes really good. Well, Tiger used to be a bartender, so if he says it's good, I'll take his word now, for do it. Now, did you put, did you put uh, is that just straight gin or did you put something no, in it? No, I put it? some tonic water in it, too. A little tonic. Yeah. Gin and tonic. Gin and tonic, right? No, nothing like gin and tonic at... Nine o'clock in the morning wow. on a Saturday. Well, yeah, but it's twelve twenty in New York. Yeah, perfect. It's five o'clock. You're somewhere. fine. There are people listening to us and will listen to us. It's part of the after. It's afternoon. So it doesn't <laughs> yeah, matter. Gonna, time is irrelevant. So those of you that are in San Diego, that uh, like uh, Veronica, who lives in Santee, that has access to KUSI, you might want to uh, turn it on. What time do you go on? Uh, Ten. 15. 10 15 yeah. and see how Tiger's doing after taking a few shots of gin here in the studio uh, before our show is over. Yeah, right? So lots Sue's, of fun. Oh, we have a quick question yes. from Sue. She says that her granddaughter in La Mesa has gophers. They ate her yellow hibiscus. Ooh. Will hibiscus grow in pots? I'm growing hibiscus in a pot. The exotic hibiscus because mine are different. great in pots, got. and they'll also grow in uh, uh, where they get more shade. Mm -hmm. uh, you can grow in sun or part shade mm -hmm. without any problems. And 
Uh, if you go to exotic-hibiscus.com, <laughs> Uh, you, you'll, uh, they mail order. They're in Fallbrook, and they'll mail order right to your granddaughter's house if you want to surprise her with something. And you'd be shocked at the varieties they have. Brian, you have two of them, right? Yeah, and, and I'm shocked at how big the actual flower is. I was going to say, flower size on some of those huge. is amazing. Huge, amazing. Yeah, and all different colors. And, and chances are she has maybe one gopher, not a lot of gophers. Yeah, but all you need is one it's to one. eat your hibiscus. Of course, and, right? And yeah. the, you've had because it. they are solitary creatures. But it's, yeah, they can they can wreak havoc. They do get together every now and then. They have to get, get a get bunch more. of baby gophers. They have to. <laughs> then they go live on their own. Uh, Trisha wants to know if you can post where to get the Walheim Ranch I will. gin again. I will share it right now. Right on our Facebook page. That's how we do it. Hey, this Thanks. show, if you missed some of the show want to watch it again, uh, by early afternoon it should be downloaded on our YouTube channel, Garden America Radio Show. Also, we encourage you to visit our website periodically because it does change. There's updates. You can sign up for the newsletter. Uh, that's, uh, I think, John, that's www.gardenamerica.com, right? Or is it just gardenamerica.com? Depends how you look at it. If you look at it one way, it's MMM. That's if you turn it upside down. Right. So, but it really is www. Just, just gardenamerica.com. So. Forget the W's. <laughs> Tiger got that got posted. It. Look at that. Just Boom. like that. Wow, that was quick. Yes, I'm on it. So See, wanna, the gin makes me work quicker. Yeah, look at your, look, you're a little happier too. He's just a little <laughs> bit happier right now. He's got the glow going. I think he brought that to share, but I don't drink and I'm allergic to lime. I know, I know. Well, I (laughs) knew you wouldn't drink anything. John drinks wine. And it's not a limoncello, so Brian won't either. I haven't had limoncello in a long time. (laughs) I started drinking this this, uh, coffee, kind of a, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, kind of a coffee liqueur. Yeah. Over ice for a while, and I got bored with that. What about (laughs) your creamy limoncello? Yeah. Can't find it. Yeah. Can't find it anywhere? Not really. I thought Bevmo had it. They had a couple of ones, but you said it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. You know what? Not the same as in Italy. Yeah. I ha- haven't found one that even comes close it's to Italian that taste. Water. You know? that, was, that was in Italy. Did you find it in it, France it, also? Remember we went over the border and we were in uh, Mentone? Maybe. Where, where they had the Mentone, famous Mentone lemon? I remember, though, that we were. it was a wine tasting. And and I said yeah, I, I, I don't want any that wine. Was in Italy, and they right. said, well, maybe you'd like this. Right. And I was like, what? What is this? Yeah. And then my eyes lit up. They had they had the lemon cello. <laughs> you were happy the whole rest of the trip. Orange cello and pistachio. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's good stuff. And over ice cream, it's even better. Wow. I think that's going to do it, guys. I think we've uh, we're going to put the cap on another show here. It was put a it fun away. show. Put this show on. Uh, Let's see, on our YouTube page, Garden America Radio Show, GardenAmerica.com. Thank you so much for joining us as you do every week. Tell your friends, your family. You can share this show on Facebook. Tiger's happy, Tiger's smiling. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend until we do it again next weekend here. I'm Brian Maine, John Bagnesker, Tiger Palafox. Be safe, and uh, thank you to BizTalk Radio as well for playing our show every week. This is Garden America. Till next time, be safe.